New Hampshire is a land of history, of contentment and charm. Here, the skill and experience of thousands of workers combine to manufacture more than 20% of the nation's total footwear requirements. Timberland, you know the name. Timberland was a construction worker boot. The Tim's validated you. They certified you. I'm telling you, we had no idea. Show me the boot. Holy shit, this stuff is really working. The brand was growing. That's when I realized style had power. Oh, Sidney Swartz got it right, mate. You know what I mean? He did. Timberland is for us. It's just one of those brands that's part of my DNA. We have warnings of more snow or rain on the way. It didn't matter the weather when it came to being fly and fashion. When you put these on, you just feel like nobody can fuck with you on planet Earth. Yo, this is normal. This is what we do. But is hip-hop an image the company is shying away from? We have respect for every consumer. Ole Timberland. Shoes Timberland. L'Italia forse credeva nel sogno americano più che gli americani. He just turned into like a Timberland monster. Tim's overpowered sneakers for him. Timberland was taking the whole by storm. They were big in New York City. When you come from nothing and you're trying to make something, you're using whatever you got. It's been about honest craftspeople taking their hands and transforming them magically. I want to say, who is Timberland? Who is that? Who is the man? Who the woman? Who, like, what family? Is it a family? Where they at? Where they live at? Where they from? New Hampshire? Here, in the rugged, wet, and mountainous landscapes in New Hampshire, the story of a boot was born. Nathan Swartz, an immigrant shoemaker, arrived in America with the dream. The dream to make quality product alongside his two sons, Sidney and Herman. This dream would see him purchase the Abington Shoe Company in 1952 and begin his journey into the American shoe business. New Hampshire became home, the harsh weather becoming the catalyst for innovation. And as the company grew, a brand was born that transcended cultures around the world. A brand whose name was inspired by the rugged Timberlands of New Hampshire. I joined Timberland in uh, July of 1974. I was a salesman, salesman for New York City. All right, ready to go? <laughs> Sydney was a character. He was a real character. Hello, show me the boot. He used to say, sell more shit. This boot should never be sold from the outside in. It should always be sold from the inside out because that's where you can see the value. That's where you can see the integrity. You want me to keep going? <laughs> he knew everybody's name knew their families. This is leather. Working with him and for him was a riot because he was just fun to work with. He always made you laugh. You got me started on leather, so now I'm giving you a leather course. He was a great factory guy. People here knew each other, and there were families actually working here. Oh, yeah. So you had to be careful, because if you said something to somebody, <laughs> you might be talking to their brother or their sister. You didn't know. Uh, it was a very exciting time and place, and we actually did become sort of a large family. You couldn't make cheap product. You couldn't make flimsy boots. You had to make it like the mill. You had to make it like the people. You had to make it like the place. And a lot of what we do springs from the mill and from the people who are here. Sydney was the happiest when he was able to bring his children into the business. That meant the world to him. I am not interested in uh, the Timberland Corporation. I am interested in the Timberland family. And I'm talking very personal about my family. Timberland without family, I don't think would work for me. The family's love for innovation and technology will go on to change the future of footwear forever. In 1973, they introduced the first waterproof leather boot by utilizing the method of injection molding. This fused rubber lug outsoles to waterproof leather uppers, virtually eliminating holes in the boot's construction, meaning no more leaking. The iconic 161 was born, or as you may know it, the yellow boot. This one yellow boot was the door that opened up for me the opportunity to become a branded company. 
We couldn't afford a big testing laboratory. The problem is the boot would float. So I ended up putting lead weights in the boot. And so on Friday afternoon, I would take a prototype, a sample of the first Timberland boot, and I'd put it in a bucket of water. And then I'd come back on Monday with my brother, and I'd go to this bucket, our testing laboratory, and we'd see where the boot was leaking and figure out how to make it better. We didn't know about being the best boot maker in the world or anything, all we knew about is practical stuff. We were lucky enough to come along and invent a category of footwear that had never been made before. That product led us into a world and a business which I knew nothing about. In the beginning, the work boots that were out there they were stiff and rugged and heavy. The process of injection molding was a more flexible, softer process. He went and used this new buck leather, this yellow buck leather. Nowadays, we take it for granted. New buck, yellow buck, the yellow boot, it's everywhere. Back in 73, 74, it was very special. People would look at it and touch it and not know what to think about it. They'd never seen it before. And the whole idea of waterproof was one that just caught people's attention. And that's where Timberland was born. Timberland brand expanded, its reputation grew beyond the rugged mountains of New Hampshire to the cold city streets of New York, while blue-collar workers on construction sites were immediately drawn to the boot. They weren't the only ones who began to take notice. In the early days of Timberland, 73, 74, you'd walk in, you have to explain who Timberland was. One day, I went into a store and I started to go through my spiel. I'm from Timberland, we're a rugged outdoor fashion. I know who you are. I'm like, holy shit, this stuff is really working. And the brand was growing. By 1979, Timberland sales reached $16 million. Last year, they came to more than $84 million. When people were looking at us and saying, how's this brand growing so fast? Well, one thing is we're spending a lot of money on advertising. Timberland. What if we suit just $59.88? Also, we had a lot of kids in the brand. They would buy these boots, and they loved the boots. The more you have it, the more you wear it, the more you like it. It's like an old friend. Ten years ago, I started wearing Timberland. To keep your feet warm and dry? Very warm, very dry. Had them in college. And in college, we used to sketch. We used to hang behind the trucks and ride downtown in our Timberland boots. What kind of boots are those things, anyway? 12281, eight inch wheat mini buck. Oh, the ones I've got on? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was talking about my other boots. I have too many pairs. So obviously, it made a real emotional connection with people. By 1979, this emotional connection with consumers caught the attention of Giuseppe Veronese, the singers of Los in Italy, an Italian man who recognized the company for what it was, but more importantly, what it could be. Giuseppe, in very many ways, invented the brand. Before we knew what our brand was, our brand had a personality and a point of view that was authentic from place. We weren't brand builders as in instinctively, we were manufacturers. We had a, an Italian guy come to, to visit in 1979 uh, who had smelled the essence of the brand. I, don't, I honestly don't know how he found it. He bought 6,000 pairs of one style shoe. Italy was the market of the finest leather and handcrafted shoes and boots for men and women. And this guy wants to buy this heavy, rugged shit and sell it in Milan. Giuseppe sold all 6,000 pairs and he came back and he said, I want to create a distributor's business in Italy. So I come to find out that this guy is a marketing whiz. He understands the quality of a brand and he saw something that no one else saw. Giuseppe took black and white photos of the boots, took the laces out, covered them with mud, hung them from a clothesline and ran an ad in Italian and said, if you love me, treat me like dirt. And so I got the ad translated like, what, what the, the hell, hell is he talking, talking about? about? Well, he wasn't selling boots. He was selling New England rough spirit, independence and, and romance. He came to us and said, it, it's not a boot, it's a brand. And we said, got it. It's American fashion the Italian way. They call themselves Paninaro. The must-have is the Timberland boot. Timberland, shoes, Timberland. One half million pairs a year sell here, but in Italy, it's risky wearing them. Last year, they sold me my Timberland boots, and I went home with my stocks. Eh, 
Queste scarpe rappresentano ovviamente per il paninaro un, un oggetto di culto, è, un, è parte culturale, è entrata in ognuno di noi, è, è come se fossimo intrappolati in uno spazio temporale dal quale è difficile uscirne. Ci sono state altre culture dopo la nostra, ma la nostra è rimasta, tra virgolette, inimitabile e, e quindi ce la teniamo stretta. I paninari si contraddistinguevano dal, dal fatto che dovevano proprio ostentare totalmente la ricchezza. L'ostentare, eh, l'essere appariscente, l'essere esuberante era nello stile del paninaro. Sino ad allora Milano sembrava vuota, i paninari la riempirono, la colorarono. At the time you drive around the cities and of course in Italy, not so much in Europe, there are a lot of scooters out there. And every kid in a scooter had a pair of Levi jeans on, a Montclair jacket and a pair of Timberland chuckers with Timberland shoes. That was the uniform. Insomma, questo stile americano arrivò a influenzare quello che era lo stile paninaro che comunque di base era made in Italy, ma mischiava un po' la cultura americana con quella appunto nazionale. Why did you buy that coat? Because uh, I see uh, the film Top Gun. La, la Timberland eh, era molto insomma, forte, ma nel 1986, quando uscì eh, Top Gun, quello diede una seconda vita al paninaresimo. E completare il loro outfit, che all'epoca si chiamava Pan Look, con i ferri. I ferri erano ovviamente le, le moto. Il mio primo paio di Timbaland comprato fu nel 1985, erano delle Timbaland ciucca. Ecco, io quelle Timbaland fu influenzato fortemente dalla campagna pubblicitaria del momento, chiama le Timbaland le tratta male. Quindi presi queste scarpe, le caricai di grasso di foca e le misi nel forno a 200 gradi. Queste scarpe presero proprio l'aspetto di quelle della propaganda eh, che veniva trasmessa anche in televisione, nelle varie riviste da motociclismo, moda, eccetera, ed era un aspetto molto molto tenebroso, vissuto, come se avessero vissuto 200 anni queste scarpe, però andava di moda così, appena comprate si prendevano, si strisciavano contro le pareti, contro i marciapiedi. La caspa! La domanda overseas was just out of control. We would hear stories about flight attendants and pilots buying an extra piece of luggage and filling it up with Timberlands and bringing them home and reselling them for more money. Pronto? Not a one-off, sì, sì. but over and over again. Grazie. Pronto? Grazie. Timberland, eh, quando ero preadolescente, era lo status symbol definitivo che potevi metterti ai piedi. Era così uno status symbol che addirittura uno si comprava le Timberland, tornava a casa e si comprava il frantoio con l'inchiostro, con la penna stilografica per ripassare l'alberello della Timberland per fare in modo che si vedesse ancora di più. Doveva essere palese che tu avevi le Timberland. E quello è il mio rapporto negli anni Ottanta. Allora, negli anni Ottanta l'Italia forse credeva nel sogno americano più che gli americani, perché praticamente eh, noi arrivavamo da un decennio molto cupo. Poi finalmente, quando negli anni 90 scoprì il rap, cominciavo a vedere sulle copertine, soprattutto dei rapper di New York, che indossavano le Timberland. Allora ne sposai completamente la filosofia. Carpone Timberland nei video rap era come se sottolineasse la potenza del genere e delle liriche. E quindi erano tutte cose che erano aliene alla cultura italiana. Timberland fu un po' il ponte, perché era qualcosa di fashion, di figo, di ben fatto, ma anche di resistente, e fatto per durare nel tempo, proprio come noi della working class. Allora a quel punto l'abbiamo riadottato e riadattato. Like it or not, rap is here to stay. It has become part of mainstream commerce. Now rappers are selling left and right. As hip hop began to dominate the airwaves and TV sets across America, the fashion trends popularized by black culture also spread far and wide. 
This adoption of the yellow boot took the brand in a direction they never saw coming. G. Keith Alexander brings us What's Hot in New York. It's like the uniform of a New Yorker. This was a mandatory shoe, especially where I was from, man. Everybody wore it. My mother wore it. It was all city. It was everywhere. When you first put it on, it makes you feel like you made it. Something about having that Timberland boot was empowering. It looked rough, it looked rugged. But what I'm doing is really paying homage to that East Coast shit. If you showed up in a fresh pair of Tim's, you were somebody. They better be fresh, though. That's all that count. The hip hop community took their arms and wrapped it around the boot and decided these are ours. I got Timberlands I work in. I got Timberlands I wash cars in. I got Timberlands I clean the basement with. I got Timberlands I do yard work in. When you come to my house, you'll, you'll see at least three pair of Tims at the front door. Old, beat up, you know what I mean? I don't even bring them inside no more. Man, I, you know, some, something about Timberland, man. I, I just feel like that's what I'm supposed to be wearing, man. You know, Rock Kim and Timberland, man. Go hand in hand. Timberland wasn't hip hop when they came out, but we made it hip hop. People look at them, they're like, yo, those are, those are work boots, bro. But we just knew it looked right. It was people being original, people being innovative and, you know, expressing themselves. Some people wasn't stringing them up, some people wasn't putting strings in them. It, it started to change your mindset on what fly is, what the thing is. And we started to realize we control that. I control that. You control that. You know, once I realized what was up, man, you know, the Timberlands was taking the hood by storm. They was big in New York City. The Timberlands was on fire. I think hip hop in general is like, it comes from the streets. It comes from people who weren't given a voice, weren't given a platform, weren't given that many opportunities, and it kind of created itself out of that need to be heard, to be seen, to be, you know, so when you come from nothing and you're trying to make something, you're using whatever you got. And you're, and you're making it fly, and you know, the streets have always been good at that. We may not have a lot, but I'm gonna show you how to put this outfit together with these fresh Tims or these, whatever it is. The cheese boot was everywhere. Anywhere you looked on the street, whether it's at people on the payphone, you know, dudes hanging on the corner playing CeeLo, in the train station, at the movie theaters. You know, we used to come in the movie theater 30, 40 deep. And when we were in there, you heard 30 or 40 boots going up the steps at one time. So all you heard, like soldiers marching. Because you know, you hear that sound of them Tims, you know, you hear that that ruggedness, man. Rough like Timberland where, yeah, me and the clan and yo the land cruisers out there. Peace to all the crooks and all the killers with bad looks. Bull head braids and blows his hook. Rough like Timberland where, yeah, me and the clan and yo the land cruisers out there. This is one of my rhymes that we did, you know, in the 36 chambers. Just saying that line right there, I just felt like it represented our lifestyle, rough and rugged. And when we hit that stage, yeah, 85% of us is, is Timberland up. Just letting the world know, here we come. Here come this, this new group of hardcore cats that they look exactly what they speak and what they talking about. You could tell it's real. In those years, probably about junior high school, that's when I realized style had power. Hip hop came on the radio Friday and Saturday only. And I would be locked and loaded, ready to go, ready to tape on my stereo and a cassette tape to tape all the newest rap songs. I would listen to DJ Red Alert. I would listen to Mr. Magic. 
And in listening to the songs, I was inspired. Um, I thought about wardrobe. I thought about the fashion story that would complement these songs, that these rap songs that I was listening to. And I would just visualize what these artists would be wearing. When I heard the music, when I heard the sound, the beats, the energy, the authentic storytelling, it just took me to another world. I was on the radio in the 90s, mid 90s, when like army fatigues was the thing. And you know, Timberlands just went right along with that whole look, that whole fit. I think that's where it really became a staple. You know, being hard was like, you know, Mob Deep and Group Home and Wu-Tang, Black Moon. You could see Nas in Queensbridge wearing Tim's. I remember Biggie always in Timberlands. If I close my eyes and imagine Big, that's all I could see on his feet. You know, I remember early visions of like Tupac on the red carpet with Timberlands on and you knew what the nod was. The nod was to the culture. It wasn't like they were wearing them on the carpet because they needed it for utility purposes. The Timbaland went along with the timeline of fashion in hip hop as it evolved. When you see artists like, you know, Mary J. Blige coming around and she's wearing Tim's and Jodeci's wearing Tim's and, you know, Misa Hilton had a lot to do with that. Putting Tim's on R&B artists to help connect them to the hip hop culture. Before Jodeci came out, R&B singers who were singing love ballads, they dressed, um, they dressed up more on the classy side. But Jodeci's image changed all of that. It was much more rough and rugged. It was heavily hip hop influenced. And Timbaland was a part of that look. It was Timbaland boots, baggy jeans, hoodies, baseball caps turned to the back. It represented hip hop fashion. It also celebrated black fashion and fashion from my community that I always knew. And now the world got to see it. Once the ladies started wearing it, it was something that was spreading like wildfire. A lot of our queens of hip hop was rocking the Timbs, man. You know, salt and pepper, MC Light. I think about MC Light and 40 Below's. Cause you know, the girls had the little feet though. So the, the little of the foot is the, the doper they were. Spandex, Timbs, denim jeans, Timbs. If a woman just pull up out of a truck and she got constructions on. Sweatsuits, Timbs. What? Oh my God. It was like love at first sight watching them rock them. It would be a line of a thousand people trying to enter the tunnel nightclub with the security searching the Tims. And so you got to take your Tims off to make sure you ain't got no weed, you ain't got no knives in there. And being Big Pun, we were about to get beat up by like 10 security because Pun ain't want to take his Tims off. He was a big guy, He's, you know, 600 pounds. So we all get in with the security and then out of nowhere, we hear this strange voice and it's like, yo, Joe, yo, Pun, let's beat these guys up. And we turn around, it's Iron Mike Tyson. It's like a dream come true. If, if, if you could just freeze time and be like, yo, God, and God would be like, you got one guy, who do you want? It was I am Mike Tyson. I am Mike Tyson, a professional fighter. And it was all about we wouldn't take off our Tims. It's crazy. Well, you getting that talk from Fat Joe, legendary shit, soundbite mania. <laughs> Good evening. No sooner has the Northeast begun digging out of the big blizzard than we have warnings of more snow or rain on the way. It didn't matter the weather when it came to being fly and fashion. Some people across the states don't get us rocking Timberlands in the summertime. Yo, this is normal. This is what we do. Tennis skirts, shorts, jean shorts. Tim's is all year round. I used to come to the park with Timberlands to play ball and they, ah, you can't do that. Yes, I can. You know what I mean? We had all black on and we had Tim's on the beach. They wear them anywhere, pool party. It looked like you literally just dropped us from another planet. But what I'm doing is just really paying homage to that East Coast shit. In hip hop fashion, customization is super important. When you think about custom outfits, the next step would be to customize your Tim's. Speaking with clothes, that's a whole language. Definitely became a canvas. Dipset's gonna take the Tims and they're gonna customize them, and oh boy, he had the Burberry joints. That's the Harlem thing, you know what I mean? You know, we start coming up with names for them. We start, 
calling them branches. Oh, you gotta get the mac and cheese. That's the brown with like the beige on the inside. They was just the cheese Tim's. The potato and broccoli, that was the cream ones with the green inside. Oh, what are those? I said, yo, they the beef and broccoli. That was the brown with the green inside. You had to follow our laws, our rules, our slang, our language. Just part of the culture now, man. But as the 90s progressed, rumors within hip hop culture spread as some felt the love they had for the brand wasn't reciprocated. We didn't know what hip hop was, what it meant, or what it represented. People said to us, you know, 16, 18 year old kids are wearing the boot as a, as a fashion symbol, they're not lacing it up. You mean they're not, they, their feet get wet if they don't lace up their boot. I mean, I don't mean to sound like I fell off a turnip truck, but I'm telling you, we had no idea. Timberland, you know the name. The Timberland look is a big hit with many inner city kids, especially those who are into hip hop. We look to most of those brands because they were luxury brands and we were poor. So it helped build our confidence. It helped us feel like we belonged. But is hip hop an image the company is shying away from? The Source magazine says Timberland is making a fortune from the hip hop generation. They was like, holy shit. Like, we just fucking struck gold and ain't even know that we struck gold. The Source magazine says Timberland is undercounting its sales from this group. Timberland claims only 5% of its sales comes from this inner city culture. Let me tell you something real quick, and I'm gonna be honest. Timberland was a construction worker boot. They wasn't thinking that hip hop was gonna adopt this boot. He made them for hiking and for working. He didn't make them for the black people and the Puerto Rican people. And instead of like trying to say that, you know, minorities shouldn't buy their clothes, they should be thanking us for buying their clothes. What kind of moron business person would say, you're not good enough to buy my product? It's an illogical statement, and it's also an immoral statement. And it's a statement that we don't subscribe to. We have respect for every consumer. I don't think the brand had any idea what was happening. I don't think it was something you could foresee. When you sit down, you don't be like, oh, we're going to make these for these guys working on the bridge, and then we're going to see Jennifer Lopez in them. <laughs> Timberland also points to its ongoing campaign, Give Racism the Boot. Give Racism the Boot. There was no way this, this shoe, which was accessible to me, was not for me. It was definitely for me. I love the campaign so much, I would actually steal those posters out of the sleeves that they, they sat in in subway cars. I'd slip them right out, take them home, and put them on the wall. We've disdained competitors when we should have paid attention. We've misunderstood consumers when we should have been listening, we were talking. Really, to me, hip hop fashion and black fashion and black people is the reason why Timberland is an iconic boot. Young people with the energy of that movement, music and culture, they're a deeply important part of the fashion scene, and uh, we're gonna work humbly and hard to earn their trust. As Timberland began to understand the power of hip hop, hip hop continued to show its power by bringing the boot to the masses. Uh -oh. Dog Damn Max, he just fell in love with any six inch, any design, any color, any texture, any, it didn't matter. He just turned into like a Timberland monster. Tim's overpowered sneakers for him. He didn't like sneakers no more. You know what I mean? It was crazy. Yo, he was so swaggy. Just the way he wore it and all of that, it spoke to me. This Timberland is for us. His style was different than anybody ever when he got the overalls half strapped on with the blood burgundy boots and all of them people. It was Woodstock, so it was like, he was at a, a festival. It was a crowd full of white people. But I thought it was dope how he was unapologetic about his expression. Like he was like the hood superhero. Like we wear the dog collar, choker. He was a super rock star with Tim's on. A dog is a dog! That vision of that performance will be in everybody's head forever. Priceless, timeless, untouchable. And see what he's rocking. <laughs> I think you lost.
fought for a dream that came true to life. And I ask you to bless everybody that's right here tonight. I know for a fact they wasn't expecting kids and people of all color to just pick this as their number one boo. I guess that probably made them be like, yo, you know what? We gotta start taking this fashion thing to the next level with this brand. And I think that that's what happened. We saw Timberland as the greatest bootmaker. I think it was the brand that brought people together, you know, from the construction workers to the hip hop artists and everything in between. They were all coming in, you know, hunting for these boots. I first started working at David Z in 1995. I started working in the stock room. At the time I was 13, what you see today with athletic footwear being the craze, back then uh, it was all about boots. 8th Street was the epicenter of culture. People were coming from all over the place. They could probably get one or two styles of boots by, by where they lived, but the idea was to come somewhere where there was the widest selection to pick from. David Z is a legendary store, but that was like prestigious going down there. You know, David Z's was like, oh man, we in Soho. You know, we Bronx guys. Bronx guys don't leave the corner. It was like a block party on Saturday and Sunday. All of the artists would come to the block. The kind of people that were shopping the store, like you wouldn't believe the names. We love clothes. We love shopping. We used to go boost. For us, fashion was excelling to a degree. Once you get money, you know the first thing you do, yo, I'm going shopping. I was so young at the time and everyone was so cool to me. It, they made me love their music and their art even more. Jay-Z used to come by almost every week and buy two fresh pairs of construction Tims and leave his old pair there. Those are the memories that really shaped, you know, my obsession and passion for the brand. The year's 2005 and I have a shop in the Lower East Side. We released a sneaker and that sneaker caused quite a bit of a ruckus and a sensation. There was like a camp out, a riot, people got arrested. We had just come back to the store recovering from this riot that had occurred. These two guys walk in, they had like button down gingham shirts that were tucked in. They look like feds. I was like, great, there's like more drama. So I come out and they were like, uh, we're from Timberland. We would like a riot too. It was amazing. That's how we met. That's how my relationship with Timberland began. I'm a creator and a designer that thinks it's function first, form second. And this is why I love footwear in general, is how switching up your footwear can change your whole mood. So if you put these on, you just feel like nobody can fuck with you on planet Earth. In 1998, before any collaborations on footwear, David had the idea of adding a gray boot to the offering. Word of mouth traveled so quickly that people were driving up from Virginia, from North Carolina, from Florida, uh, because that was the only way to get the boot. It was the first time from like the early 90s to 98 that we're so used to seeing the same three, four colors of the construction boot and they're all browns and blacks to see this gray boot. It was like the most disruptive moment of the time. It changed the landscape of, I think, all brands. And it also showed Timberland what they could do outside of what they were doing. So I think that really changed the game. When I started to like visit Stratham and New Hampshire and start to learn about Timberland, I started to understand its innovative roots and sustainability roots. I mean, Timberland's been on this tip for like a really long time now, since day one. You know, sustainability, innovation, and the impact on Earth is number one. My parents are Polish, but I grew up in Copenhagen. I was born there. I didn't grow up having much and whatever I, I saw that was like American culture was through music and through film. With the influence I have of American culture and growing up in Copenhagen, those two worlds have like created something that's very unique for me. New York as a city, people were not scared to express themselves when it comes to fashion. It kind of made me feel like there's like room for anyone. Like you can wear whatever and people will never be like, oh, that's weird or you can't do that, you know? I love that the six inch boots can be styled and worn in so many ways. And I think it's just really one of the main reasons why I respect 
the design of it so much. I think the Timberland boot became an icon because the culture made it that way. And Timberland did its job by producing an incredible classic, iconic model that served functionality, protection, waterproofing. But it was the culture that added the flavor and made it a staple, if you will, in footwear forever. I was like, if I'm gonna do a collaboration with any company, I was like, it has to be Timberland. I always really loved patent leather. And my initial thought was like, man, we're gonna keep it simple and clean and timeless. And we just made it like a weed patent leather. It got its own name as glazed donuts. Like that's how people like talk about them. Like, do we got the glazed donuts, or, you know? Just that itself makes me feel like I've done something, you know? So shout out to whoever designed this booth. <laughs> Not many people know this, but my first collaborative project was actually on a Timberland boot. It's just one of those brands that's part of my DNA. It's part of the last 28 years of my 40 years of my existence on this earth. You know, I'll be a fan of the brand for the rest of my life. As the yellow boot story became ingrained in American culture, history was simultaneously being written in various corners of the globe. It's not a question of why is it, it just is. When something makes it through, every struggle is part of people's lives, that's the difference. It came from people in the hood. This work that was made that we're all rocking and it, and it seeped into England and ravers and, and the gay community and gangsters in London. How do you, how do you quantum that? It just is. I mean, I came from the Midlands, which is the middle of England, which is the middle of nowhere. And of course, for me, subway art, graffiti, that's, the, that's our Bible, if you like, as, as one book that we opened and, and showed us the world. The, the experience of going to New York at 17 and a half was mind blowing. As soon as you got on a train, you just saw style. From Timberlands to, to leathers, to people just wearing stuff that you were like, the way it would hang on you and the way it would look. You just wanted it, you wanted to be a part of it. I always felt like I was living in another world. I'd seen something I was never gonna let go of. And seeing Timberlands in London was kind of like, it's coming, it's coming. It just exploded globally. It was a really weird time seeing how it had just got into different parts. It, wasn't, it was no longer just hip hop's baby anymore. It was everything for everyone. 86, 87, 88, really important years. And I think rave culture is the next in line of the heritage of ravers that have kind of gone into wearing Timberlands and wearing, you know, bright colored t-shirts and just not giving a fuck. And there's guys on speakers, you know, in the field with, with Tim's on, you know, as long as my feet warm, I don't give a fuck. Every week there was a rave. Everywhere you turned, it was the sound coming out of the UK. And we had, we'd taken American breakbeat culture. We took those breaks, we sped them up a little bit. And we're at it. And the thing about rave culture, rave culture brought every type of person together. People would drive for miles just to go to a place. There's no internet, guys. It's a phone number. You get given it, and you're gonna know where you're gonna go to a rave. And you would drive for three, four hours. We were telling you about giant outdoor raves happening across the region almost every weekend. Party organizers accused the police of using new legislation to try to stamp out the craze altogether. We were fighting against the government. They were trying to close parties everywhere. It was a real infringement of what freedom really is. Officers will also pose as party goers to get the details they need. So, uh, you got any raves on this weekend? And I think that was where the, the politicians stopped listening to what we were about. And they didn't want us to be together. They didn't want us to have our free. They didn't want us to speak. They didn't want us to speak. There wasn't an inch of violence. There wasn't no trouble. We was there in love and unity. And the more they didn't want that, we got louder. And we let the music speak. And trust me, we can make music speak and make it loud. We've always been the same. We want music, we want it loud, and we want to just express ourselves. And as far as rave culture moving around and being this 
infamous thing. We got shot out, it became a problem. We were just moving into the clubs. Being in London at the time, we were at the WAG, we were at Bass Clef. We were at these places where it was just rave, it was a gay scene, it was the Brain Club. I mean, these places were infamous. All of this stuff that was moving into the clubs, you had the doorman wearing Timberlands now. We keep changing and adapting out of drum and basses, jungle and dubstep and all these different things, but you'll still see people wearing them. Right? So it's always been the same, but worked in all these various cultures, but it's moved amongst all of it. It's like the concrete ball that rolls. Once it starts to gain momentum, it cannot be stopped.東京は日本の中でいろんな人が集まってくる一番大きな都市なので、そこにいろんなスタイルがある中で、そのスタイルの中に埋もれない自分のスタイルを作るっていう意味でも、東京でそうだったことはすごく大きかったなと思います。
It's part of our DNA. I see that boot ain't going nowhere. Especially if a New Yorker got anything to do with it. Quando noi italiani sposiamo una cosa, la sposiamo fino in fondo. Team Berland and Proud. I've always known the value of hip hop fashion, hip hop culture, and Timberland was always a part of it. When I travel around the world and I see somebody with a pair of Tim's on, that's my tribe. I need about at least 30 to 40 pairs a year. <laughs> you know? Over everything else, look after your mom, <laughs> right? First, and look after your feet. That's it, that's it. Timberland's life, that's what we grew up wearing. We had the beef and broccoli and the mac and cheese, we had them all. When you have something that's classic, it will stay forever. I know my friends call me shy, like I'm straight out of Chicago, but it's Harlem world to the grave, that's all I know. Peace. wanted to build great products out of great materials with good people. And we actually did become sort of a large family. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't easy, but it was real, and it was in some sense profound. And this notion of connection back through time and forward through time is a really important thing to me. And I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose that. That's human been about honest craftspeople taking their hands, taking raw materials like my grandfather and my father did, and transforming them into magical. He put his hands on leather, and a yellow boot came out. 